Bitte. Ja. Ready. Okay, let's do this. And now, and I felt like I was about to cough or something, and then it went away. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> Goodness. Mm -hmm. All right. I'm here in my uh, dining room, which is also half of the living room. Okay. In our small condo. And there are two small dogs. And, and a cat. No? And a cat. And they're all here in the room with me. Good. And then right your audience. Here, right over here, I have my piano. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Everything's here. I have everything I need. Good. All right. Here we go. We're going to start recording now. The cell phones have been silenced. The wine has been poured. And these glasses are not props. It's real wine. And just like that, the podcast begins. The Tall Mike Wine Podcast. The wine podcast that's not all about wine. The wine podcast like no other Number 14 on the feed spot list of the best wine podcasts. And I'm your host, the eponymous Tall Mike Wine. Welcome to the podcast, heard in 66 countries and on six continents and in 48 of these United States. If you're wondering who the slackers are, it's both of the Dakotas, North and South. Weird, right? From Huntsville, Alabama to Huntington, West Virginia. From Austin, Texas to Mound, Minnesota. Yes, Mound. Birthplace of the Tonka Truck. You see, the eastern part of Mound sits right on Lake Minnetonka. You get it? Wherever you are, I thank you for listening. Now, get to work drumming up a little more action for the podcast. Rate and review and tell your friends. They tell me it helps a lot. Also, get yourself subscribed so you don't miss an episode. If this is your first time here, well, hey, thanks for finding me. When this episode is over, scroll through the previous two and a half years worth and check out my archive of episodes. It's all available for free. Now it's time to begin episode 44 from my home studio in Novato, California. And my guest is zooming in from Mexico City. He created and operates a culinary experience company called Kua Cocina Nomada, creating personalized experiences with food at people's homes or places like the beach or in the forest. He also hosts not one, but two podcasts, one in Spanish called Vino Con Todo and the brand new English language podcast, Wine It All. Man, I better step up my game. I'm a total slacker with just one podcast in English. Let's say hello to Javier De La Torre. Hola, amigo. Hola, amigo. Hello, Mike. How are you? It's, uh, it's very good to see you, and uh, thank you for the invitation. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to uh, be a guest in your, in your podcast, and, uh, well, here we are. Here we are. I should say this, that this is another episode that was inspired by an encounter I had with you and your wife at Nicholson Ranch in Sonoma, where I work. And this is something that's happening more and more often. I mentioned that I have a podcast and someone says back to me, I have a podcast also. And it was lovely spending some time with you and your wife, Tita, uh, a few weeks back. You were here in California. You were just cruising through the area, drinking some nice wine, having a beautiful vacation. Exactly. That was a, that was a very good uh, coincidence. Uh, I have to say that uh, we had a great time, my wife and I, with uh, that uh, uh, wine tasting that you hosted, and uh, very interesting to see all the all the surroundings in Napa, Sonoma. But uh, uh, very good coincidence that uh, both uh, have a podcast, and uh, it's uh, it's great to be here, my friend. I think this is now the fourth or fifth time. Uh, I've met somebody that has a podcast, and and of course I have them on my podcast to talk about that, and then I go on their podcast, and I'm going to be on your podcast, right? That's right. That's right. We are uh, doing this one-to-one uh, -one, uh, uh, podcast uh, chat, and it's uh, it's incredible. You now the with the magic of technology and uh, the way to to connect people, to connect places. It's just, uh, I think it's a it's a great idea. This uh, 
uh, this podcast and this way to to connect with people. Huh? I love it so much. I love that I can just dial you up on Zoom and I can see your face. I can see your smiling exactly. face. <laughs> <laughs> so let's first talk about Vino Con Todo, the podcast, which was your first podcast. When did you start it and why did you start it? Well, it was a, um, a few months ago. Uh, I, I do a volunteering in a, in a place that I study for, uh, for translation. Yeah, I, I do some translation, some simultaneous translation. And uh, uh, specifically, uh, I was uh, doing a translation for a podcast that's, uh, that this girl does for this, uh, for this organization. And uh, talking to her, it was interesting uh, to me when I heard my voice. It's, it's, very, diffi- it's very interesting when you uh, speak normally in, the, in, the, in the daily life. And when you listen to yourself in a in a recording, you, know, you find out that you have to take care of certain details. You no, know? right. And, Everybody uh, that, hates it when they hear their voice on tape for the first time. <laughs> that's right. Everybody. And I, <laughs> exactly. And and I noticed that my, my the way of uh, I spoke in the, in the translation was very different. As one of the things that my wife told me. And anyway, I was talking to this girl, and uh, uh, she told me, "Listen, um, I I do some." Uh, uh, training for for people who wants to do some uh, uh, a podcast, and in those days I was I was thinking about doing something else about my activities related to to gastronomy, to uh, to wine, um, to uh, I am I am uh, doing right now the certification for sommelier, and then I told this girl, well, I, I wanted to, I want to take a training with you for doing the podcast. It was very fun, a lot of uh, interesting stuff that she taught me about how to record about uh, how to schedule your your interviews should you know about this, all these details mm-hmm. and uh, that's why I started so I took the training and uh, a few few months ago I just uh, launched my my first episode and it's been a lot of fun it is fun I I have yeah. a blast doing my podcast yeah <laughs> I've actually listened to a few episodes uh, however mi español is muy malo so tell me what happens on the show <laughs> Who do you talk to? What are the topics? Well, what what, what uh, happens on the show is that uh, main purpose is to connect with people uh, related to to wine, food. I am um, my my audience is uh, uh, basically foodies, you know, people who is looking for new experiences in the restaurants, the wines, and uh, new new ways to to enjoy the uh, uh, a moment with your beloved ones either at restaurant or at homes. So I've, um, I've connected with the chefs, sommeliers, uh, companies that uh, sell wines, or somebody that has uh, a certain type of experience related to, uh, to food and wine. And uh, by doing so, it's interesting because uh, you end up uh, getting to know interesting people, to learn a lot from people, and uh, that's basically the the, the idea, no? To to connect, and I divide it in three in three basic areas: the the people, the places, uh, and the experiences. And uh, after doing some uh, connection with the with the uh, the people that I am interviewing or, or that are participating in the in the episode, to the, the ones that I'm chatting to, to do some call to action, to you know, to offer to our audience some kind of special deal or or an invitation to to know the the place to know the the experience that my guest is offering. That's cool. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's fascinating. People that are in the culinary world or the wine world, uh, a lot of them didn't intend to get into that world when they were young. And I find that doing this podcast, just that story, how you went from being whoever you were, whoever you thought you were when you were young, <laughs> to being who you are now in the world of food, uh, the culinary world or the wine world, uh, those transitions are pretty fascinating, and we're going to talk about yours uh, a little later. But first, yeah. I want to talk about the new podcast. Now you're branching out the new English language podcast, Wine It All. What inspired you to do another podcast? Because I know they take a lot of work, a lot of time. Is it going to be kind of the same thing? You'll be talking to people, but only in English. Yeah, th- th- that's the idea. No, uh, when I uh, uh, when I came with the with the name in Spanish. I thought well, uh, and and especially related to that story that I told you that I, I volunteer on on, on translating. Mm-hmm. Uh, I said, well, uh, th- this is a a tool or a talent that I have, and uh, maybe sometime I can use it. I, I and also would be interesting to uh, 
uh, expand to another countries or to people here in Mexico that uh, only speak uh, English. And also that uh, knowing that, uh, especially in Mexico City, there's a lot of uh, uh, good options on the on the wine and food industry. And there's uh, a lot of people from around the world that's uh, uh, turning their, their, their attention to Mexico City because of the uh, culinary offers uh, that we have, no. So I thought it was a good idea, and then I came out with with this uh, with this name, uh, which make made uh, sense that it's similar to the to the name in in Spanish because the 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 name in Spanish means uh, uh, wine with everything, mm-hmm. and uh, but uh, didn't sound too too good in English. So this phrase kind of came up to my mind, and then I and I think that uh, it sounded okay, no. <laughs> I like it. Wine it all, <laughs> and I'm going to be on the show. And that's oh, yeah. coming up. It's coming up soon. Now we're recording this uh, in the last few days of August. You're launching that on September 1st. That's right. On, on, on September, early September, I'm going to launch that. Okay. So keep an eye out for that. You can find it on all the apps. Are you putting it on all the apps? You better be. Yeah, sure. On all apps. I think I missed the last thing you just said there. It froze for just oh, a yeah. second. Yeah, that is good to be on the on the map on the on the podcast uh, uh, technology, you know, in, in on all the platforms and everything. Yeah, when you say you can find it wherever you find podcasts, you better That's be right. on all the apps. Exactly. <laughs> There's a whole bunch of them. All right, now has come the time on the Tall Mike Wine Podcast where I ask my guest Javier De La Torre, what <laughs> is in your glass? Good. I have here. Uh, a red wine. Uh, it's a Cotsuron uh, village, and uh, it's good. It's uh, uh, you know in this uh, in that area, they do some uh, very interesting wine, which I'll I'll tell you. What do we have here? Um, just give me a second. I'm just mm-hmm. uh, take your time. You a, a smell. Take your time. Mm, well, it's uh, it's uh, from from uh, South Ron, and it's uh, it's a blend. Okay. Has Pira, uh, Grenache, Monastrella, and Carignan. Okay. But it, it's a it's a wine uh, that I uh, regularly uh, drink. You know, on the weekdays, it's uh, easy to drink. It has uh, very good aromas of uh, of red fruits. Uh, some kind of some. Uh, uh, it's, it has good acidity, so it. Uh, I think it's a, it's a very good uh, good option for uh, for a relaxing lunch or for a. Uh, or for talking, or, or a good wine for talking to my friend on the podcast. <laughs> Every wine is good for talking oh, yeah. on the podcast. Do you have the bottle there? Can you hold it up? Can I take a picture yeah. of it? Yeah, sure. I take a picture of things, and then uh, oh yeah, I see what it is. It's the uh, you have Costco down there. <laughs> That's right. You know, I am a I am a huge fan of of uh, of Kirtland wine. Uh huh. I think it's a I, I think it's a great uh, uh, quality price relation. Uh, I. Uh, in the, in the in the course that I am thinking right now, I, I the course of sommelier that I am doing right now, I learned that uh, the master sommeliers do a good job with uh, uh, with the Kirkland brand. They go to the to the vineyards and uh, made a good selection uh, selection a good blend. So mm-hmm. I found very very good quality uh, uh, wine in the in that uh, in the brand. No, cool. So that's a Kirkland Cote du Rhone. What's the vintage? Cote du Rhone. Yeah, this uh, twenty one. 2021. 2021. Very cool. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah. they do a lot of blending down there in the Southern Rhone, as oh, opposed yeah. to the Northern Rhone region where they say, no, 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 we just have Syrah up here, which is Only Syrah. Of, mm-hmm. mostly Syrah. I mean, it's mostly Syrah. That's right. Or or maybe in the Northern, it's also the region of Champagne that uh, mm. very interesting blends. No? Mm-hmm. 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 All right, I'm but taking pictures. Think... Yeah, I'm taking what pictures what you think... of you. What's that? Okay, good. What's in your glass? I'm going to tell you a little later what's in my glass. Okay, good. Excellent. I'm going to take, let's see. So it's doing that thing where it's out of focus. Yeah. Maybe I'll have you take a picture and then send it to you. Yeah, sure. I'll send it to you. I'll need a picture for the uh, the Instagram post. I post these on Instagram. And if you want to follow me on Instagram, you may do so at Tall Mike Wine. Uh, You got some coasters, right? When you were at the winery, I I gave you some coasters. 
I do, I do, uh, I do have some cultures of your Tomic wine podcast. Uh, that's a great idea. Eh? That's a great idea, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna copycat that uh, that uh, marketing. Uh, oh, you certainly you may. I mean, you're in Mexico. It doesn't matter. You know, you can, you can copy, <laughs> you can copy. It. <laughs> yes, the Tall Mike Wine Podcast coasters. I hand them out at the winery. But if you would like your own set, you can email me at tallmikewine at gmail dot com, and I will send you a small stack of the official coasters of the podcast. Uh, this company you have now, Kua Cocina Nomada. Tell me about that. Well, it was, uh, it was uh, previous to the, to the uh, pandemic years, which uh, I was kind of figuring out what to do with my life, <laughs> which uh, it's a, it's a, it's a interesting story, but uh Three three years ago, I was uh, I realized that what I liked it was uh, cooking and related to to uh, to food and wine. No? So I um, I hired a, a design company to uh, to do some analysis to to do some naming and uh, and branding uh, to start this uh, to, to to start this new new adventure. Uh, so it was a very interesting uh, process because uh, you know I sat down in a in a in a meeting room with a with a bunch of millennials and asked me questions <laughs> and uh and uh, it was good because we had a big uh, board when uh, when i answered some questions they started sticking some some uh, post-its because it was you know either emotions or either analytical oh yeah so those millennials was, was those yeah. millennials they like to put post-it notes on whiteboards they really do that, <laughs> that's right and uh, and then they came out with uh, with uh, because I told them my story and what what was my intention of, of establishing this brand, and and uh, they came out with a very interesting uh, naming, uh, because Kua is uh, is a word in a, in an indigenous language here in, in Mexico, that the 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 meaning is uh, nurturing body and soul, and um, that was that was kind of the result of the. Um, the story that I told them, because uh, I I, very, I uh, believe very strongly that uh, when you sit down in a table, uh, uh, either with friends or with family, I mean the, the the greatest memories that I have from my childhood are uh, at the table at my at my grandparents' uh, home or mm. with my parents at home. We did mm-hmm. when we did some barbecue. So I think that uh, it's something that uh, from uh, from my from, since, was, since I was a small kid. It nurtured my soul and my body because I always like to eat a lot. I mean, I remember getting into the kitchen to to my uh, my mom or my grandma uh, to see what what I could eat. No, so uh, they were kind of uh, uh, tell me, "Wait, it's not ready yet," and uh, they gave me something to eat. No, but uh, <laughs> anyway, they, they, they couldn't get rid of me, so they uh, put me to do some jobs. So I, I ended up, uh, you know, helping doing something, and uh, that's why I. I I think that the, the preparing, well, it's not even the preparing. It's, it goes uh, 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 prior to that. When you pick the when you pick the the ingredients, I remember uh, some some uh, stories from my childhood, going with uh, with my mom to the market and uh, picking the, the ingredients and everything. And I think that's where the where the story starts. You know, picking the ingredients, putting your energy on the food, mm-hmm. and then the preparing. And then, and then yeah. when we when everybody is together on the on, on the table, it's. Uh, nurtures the, the the soul and, and also the body no? and all along that uh path from and even before the the shopping there's mm-hmm. the planning you know on my day off oh, yeah. from the winery uh those are the days i choose to cook uh something a little more elaborate because i have time and those are some of the first thoughts i have in the morning when i wake up it's what am i going to cook today and then i think about it for a good several hours and then and then yes i go off to the store and then yeah. i come home and i start turning on the burners and getting out the cutting boards and the knives and start chopping things and then pretty soon the food starts hitting the hot pans and you get that <laughs> That's right. all, all of that energy i think this is what you're talking about all of that energy goes into the food and into the experience at the table and it's That's it is right. it's a beautiful thing and it's a powerful thing it's beautiful, and and uh, and one of the things that I like about cooking is uh, the, the improvisation. You know, that uh, you know, you open the fridge, and uh, based on what you have on stock, you kind of uh, 
make up some uh, kind of invent something and uh it turns out well no? it's uh it doesn't have to be a very structured recipe because no i i remember the recipes from my grandma from my mom that they have to be very specific mm-hmm. but uh, i i still do some recipes that uh, but uh, i like more the, the improvisation uh style of cooking. No? Yeah, I feel that recipes are great for people just starting out with their cooking to kind of get you an idea of what kind of things work together and what you have to have in certain things. But, you know, somebody else's uh, ratios in a recipe, how much garlic, how many onions, mm-hmm. uh, all that's all to personal tastes. So that you feeling, can start yeah. stretching things and changing things, leaving a few things out. And then you say, oh, I bet I bet I could add some of this and it would be really good because I like that. That's and, right. So yeah, improvisation in the kitchen is a really yeah. is a really great thing. So this company, Kua mm-hmm. Cucina Nomada, uh, uh-huh. you you take people places and feed them, or you go to their houses mm-hmm. and feed them. Tell me more about this. Yeah, and uh, that goes uh, with the, with the second part of the of the naming uh, that, that it's uh, uh, Kua it comes with a with a K, mm-hmm. and then. Uh, um, Cocina nomada. Uh, cocina means kitchen, mm-hmm. but uh, in Spanish it's written with a with a C. Mm-hmm. But uh, but it is written in my case with a K. I noticed uh, related that. related to the to the to the K of Cuba. Okay. And uh, cocina nomada. That's uh, it's is uh, the, the meaning is uh, nomad cuisine. So it's nomad because I don't have a place and I have a restaurant, and mm-hmm. uh, that is something that. Uh, uh, my daughters always told me, Dad, why don't you uh, put a restaurant? Because uh, you know, when I was cooking something that they like, they have some favorite dishes that I prepare. And I told them, Well, listen, I, I have a lot of respect to the to the to the restaurant business, and um, I think that uh, I like more the fun of cooking for the family and friends than uh, that uh, what it takes to set up a business. And uh, it's it's good, but I mean, it kind of uh, kind of uh, takes out the fun of of it. It's complicated, so, you know. It's complicated. No? What, and what those chefs do, you really have to give them a lot of credit. But that is oh, yeah. hard, hard work. It's a hard life. That's right. That's right. And I and I felt it too when I have when I uh, do some experiences. I have a lot of fun, but yeah, it's it's a uh, it's a hard work, no. So the the idea of the, of nomad cuisine or cocina nomada is that uh, we go to your place. Mm. No? Um, when I engage with a client, uh, I for, I like to talk with them to get to know them and ask them what they like what do i suggest and then we end up uh, uh, of uh, putting together a, a menu or some options so when i go to their to the places uh, we prepare and, and and they they help or they participate on the on the preparation huh? oh that's cool and there yeah and there's also some some spots that i have which uh, are very close where i live there are some uh, some forests here, like uh, half an hour driving. So I have some spots where we do some kind of a picnic, but uh, you know, like a, like a gourmet picnic. No, so I hire I hire a waitress. I put a beautiful table with the club mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. glasses and everything. So you're sitting there in a small valley watching the forest, and but you have you have a waiter that is taking care of you. You have the chef myself that is taking care of the of the of the of the guests, and uh, we uh, talk about stories and uh, prepare together. I have a great time together, which uh, is compared to the experience that you have in a restaurant. But I kind of uh, move the restaurant to the forest, no? Right. That's you move idea. and you move it wherever you want to. That's right. The true nomada. Nomada, exactly. Nomada. Mm-hmm. So, is it smaller groups? Is it larger groups? Is it a little of everything? Uh, it's a small groups. Um, I have some uh, some clients that, uh, for instance, um, uh, at the end of last year, this was this. Uh, it's, it's a company that they hired uh, my services for. Uh, preparing a, a, a meal at the forest for the for the directors of the company so it was uh, and, and their wives so there was like it was a group of uh, 12 people and uh, it was it was good so I, I prefer small groups mm-hmm. uh, even though also they have some some other clients that they hire me for preparing the the, the food for for the for the whole company it was like uh, 75 uh, people but but uh, in, this, in this case it's, uh, it's more logistics no I have to, right. I have to Hire more waiters and people sure. who help me. Sure. Uh, it was, but it, it was uh, also more uh, uh, business-wise interesting. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, it's uh, it's also an interesting uh, experience to to offer 
the, the experience to the, to the whole people, to the whole company. We also set up some dynamics so they can, could have fun, et cetera. But I am more to the small group, to the more group, make group, no? I have that same experience at the winery. You know, we see groups of, well, one person might come in by themselves. And then, mm-hmm. you know, we see groups of two and four and six. And as the group gets larger and we'll go up to, you know, 18, 20 people, it becomes less about the wine and more of a social thing. You get a big exactly. group of people who all work together and they never really get to, when they're at work together, socialize. You get them mm-hmm. out off of site and that's all they want to do is just hang out and talk to each other. So it's hard when I come in and say, let me tell you about this Pinot Noir. And they're all looking at me like, <laughs> we're just, we want to talk to each other. So you leave that's them alone. Right. I'd like, I'm going to pour Pinot for you. I'll tell you about it. And then I'm going to let you continue to talk to each other because you really have to listen to what, what it is your guests need from you. Yeah. Now, yeah. Now yeah. Yeah. There's a kind of a, you kind of uh, kind of measuring what they want. When is the right time to to jump in or to stay to stay behind? No? Yeah, you have to you have to listen. You know, yeah. listen and observe. I think is very 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 important. Now, yeah. is this service that you do is this aimed at at more of a wealthy clientele? Is it expensive to do this? No, it's not expensive. It, uh, it I am directed to to uh, all the the all the clients that that appreciate the experience. No, uh, so if it, if it is expensive, depending on what you want to drink or what you want to eat, no? and uh, based on that, I charge a, a service fee. Mm-hmm. But uh, but uh, it's not it's not to to wealthy people. I, I can do it for either for wealthy people or for some regular people that wants to have uh, a nice picnic. But the important ingredient for me uh, is that the client kind of appreciate and know, know knows how to enjoy the the experience. Yeah. You come here, you eat the food and just have a good time. Stay off yeah. your phone. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> don't be don't be staring at your phone the whole time. Oh yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a hard one to achieve, but uh, eventually in the in the forest uh, we achieve it. But again, I mean they they start taking pictures. I mean nowadays the, the phone is something that is uh, be, uh, practically attached to our body, no? But Yeah, you can't yeah. really avoid it. You really can't. Yeah. Yeah. It would seem to me that all of this that we've talked about, the podcasts, the Kua Cocina Nomada, I love saying that, this is all mm-hmm. recent stuff, sort of your life's second act, if you will. Mm-hmm. I want to talk about your earlier life, a lot of amazing accomplishments. You sent me your bio, and you spent mm-hmm. time in the world of finance and banking and development of a power plant in northern Mexico. <laughs> uh, you consulted for Pemex, the government-owned oil company, and then you spent a great deal of time in the fitness industry, opening fitness centers in a few states and selling fitness equipment. That's a lot of stuff, and to me, that's a lot of sort of business kind of stuff. Tell me about your early life. What pushed you on that path? to the earlier uh, life in that sort of uh, environment? Yeah, well, uh, I think that uh, life's all about the decisions and uh, what do you do in the, like, like, for instance, one of the important decisions that we make in life is uh, that, uh, what, with, what are you going to study? You know? mm-hmm. uh, when I was in my, in my uh, I was a teenager and uh, I really uh, didn't know what to study because uh, I mean honestly I was I was very good at school I, I liked everything I was good with math with uh, history and everything and uh, ended up uh, studying uh, business uh, I had a bachelor in business and um, for some reason I started working uh, at the bank uh, back in those days uh, and it was interesting because uh, well the, the, it's always good to have a financial culture uh, to know the how how the, the economy works. I remember, you know, um, uh, working at the bank, you have to read the papers. I uh, started uh, working as a money market trader. It was, uh, it was a lot of fun. <laughs> uh, it, it was like, uh, like uh, you know, going to Vegas because we were, you know, young kids uh, doing <laughs> some, uh, uh, some light boys operations. And, yeah, making um, big bets on things. Yeah, I mean... I didn't make a lot of money there. I mean, I mean, I was just uh, it was just my my salary, but uh, I I I wasn't in the in the uh, the way of people like you see in the movies that you make a lot of money. I was just, right. I was an employee there in the bank, and, but it was a lot of fun. But uh, there was this ingredient that uh, I felt that it wasn't what I liked. No? But mm-hmm. uh, I worked there because some other friends worked there. 
Then um, uh, after that, uh, for, for some reason, I uh, started working uh, for, an, for a, a big industrial company, a steel mill company that is located in northern, northern Mexico. And uh, the, 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 the tool of, of speaking English was, uh, was, the, was uh, that opened for me the door in that job because I was working with, uh, with the director of the, of the energy uh, division, which was an American guy, which by the way, his name was also Mike. <laughs> and uh, There's a lot of us. A lot of, yeah. And um, <laughs> that's why I got into this job because I kind of uh, helped this guy to communicate with the engineers, with the people in the coal mines and everything. And we, we built a very strong relationship. We, uh, we, uh, today, he's my friend. And um, that's, that's how I get into the, in, into the uh, uh, power generation uh, industry. And uh, I, I understood how to uh, develop a, a uh, a project, how to to do the project financing because I had the chance to talk to investment bankers, to investors, and everything. Okay. But but again, um, we had a lot of fun. I mean, in, in, back in those days, we were kind of the, the in the in the in the wave line of uh, working hard and playing hard. No, so <laughs> so it was a so it was a so it was a good good years. No, but anyway, it still was it still was this this kind of sense that it wasn't. But what I, what I was like that I love doing, you know, it, it was it was still a job. And then um, when I started to when I uh, get into the fitness industry, uh, I started the uh, well back in those days. Well, I, I forgot to mention so I, I I got married very young. I was married with my wife um, to my wife uh, when I was twenty four. Yeah, and, and you're uh, still married. It, yeah, we're still married. It's been a congratulations. It's been a great, it's, it's, yeah, thank you. It's been a great story. Uh, and uh, I mean, we're soulmates, and, uh, and it's something we we have lived a lot a lot of things, ups and downs, and everything. And then um, when I finished the, the 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 job at the at this power plant, because this 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 coal fire power plant didn't come to to fruition because the company that I work with come to bankruptcy. It, mm-hmm. it was a steel mill in northern Mexico, that comes from it. and that's an ingredient that that uh, comes in, in in Mexico because as as you know, um, well. Uh, my my memory from back in the eighties and the nineties is that there's been a lot of crisis in Mexico. No? Now mm-hmm. it's a little bit more stable, but uh, back in those days there was a lot of uh, instability, uh, high inflation, etc., and that affects to the people, to the business, and everything. So somehow I was working in a in a in a in a path, but then turned out to be a crisis. Though I, so, so so then I have to kind of switch lanes for doing something. Back in, and then when that crisis came, that was in the early nineties. Um, I get into the to the fitness industry, working for some big brands, you know, to beat these big box uh, gyms. Uh, and then I had the experience of product development. Uh, I know a little bit of uh, uh, finances and this and that. And then um, um, started working for these companies, and I said, well, I, I want to do my my own brand because I know how to 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 operate, to put together a business. So. Um, long story short, I uh, I gathered the money. I get some some investors, some people to, to trust me, and uh, and I started to this uh, this uh, gym in uh, in Merida. Uh, in the, in this period of time, uh, me and my family we live in different states in Mexico. We live in in, in Coahuila. We live in Cancun. Uh, we live in Merida. Uh, when we were living in Cancun, I was a sales rep for for Life Fitness, Life Fitness uh, uh, the, the fitness equipment. Mm-hmm. So that's why I, I learned the, the business to how to equip a, a hotel or a spa or, or, or a gym. No? Okay. And that's when I, it all came sense to, to when we moved to Merida, uh, it all made sense to, to put my, my own uh, fitness center. And uh, I did it so. I, uh, I started uh, good. I have uh, in, the, in the first years, uh, it was a successful business. And that's when I started to do some bad decisions because I wanted to grow fast. I uh, I partnered with some some people that I met in southern Mexico, and uh, in two three years we had like uh, four uh, four fitness centers in southeastern Mexico. But uh, made some bad decisions uh, of uh, taking some debt and everything, and then all of a sudden in Merida, uh, big players of of the fitness industry came in, and uh, 
after three or uh, the first three or four years in the in my business was was very successful. Uh, I uh, the 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 main uh, um, uh, payment that I had to do in my in my business was the, was the rent because uh, I I rented a, a place in a in a in a shopping center which was expensive, but uh, initially the it was okay to pay the rent and to do the it, it was a profitable profitable business no, but then and I started to play golf I started to not take care of the business I started to think that I could uh, had uh, uh, many fitness centers partner with people and then the the destiny reached me. <laughs> um, and after seven years, uh, I was not able to pay the rent of, of the of the business. Okay. And uh, prices prices started to go down in, in the in the in the in the, in the games. Uh, Merida is not a big uh, city, so people uh, first go to a gym, and they, if they if they open a new gym, they go to the new gym. So anyway, I after in the seventh or eighth year, I had to uh, close the business. Okay, and uh, it costs a lot of money, and uh, and that, that was it. And then it sounds and, like that type of industry is very cyclical, where you know you can oh, be yeah. up and you can be down very fast yeah. in a very That's short right. period of time. And then and then, so it sounds like things were kind of going south for you. And yeah. was that was that was that the catalyst for the major change you took into the foodie world? Was it gradual, or did you just wake up one day and say? I want to do this new thing. Yeah, it was a, it was a catalyst, and uh, and it was very interesting. And now, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty because back in those days, when it, I mean, having to close a business, it, it was a uh, it was a lot of uh, kind of uh, different events that uh, led me to that uh, to that place. And uh, nowadays, I recognize that uh, well, when you do that, it's, it's because of you made bad decisions and because uh, of uh, something that we have to correct. Mm -hmm. also, or it, it was a learning process, no? Sure. Uh, uh, at the end of the day, it was a learning process, and yeah, it was a catalyst. And I said, well, when when, in, when I closed the business, we came back to Mexico City when we had our home, and uh, and I said, well, what am I gonna do? And uh, that's when I uh, back in those in those days, I also starting uh, starting. I connected with uh, with the study of of uh, of Kabbalah. I am a student of uh, a student of Kabbalah. For now, for like uh, ten or twelve years, and that helped me a lot uh, because uh, uh, I was in in those in those years uh, I was uh, kind of lost in certain areas. But this uh, this study helped me a lot to find myself and to 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 recognize the the, the right path. No? So yeah, back going back to Mexico City, I said, well, it's important to do what you like and uh, like what you do. So. Uh, I've always liked to cook. Um, in Merida, I, I started uh, going to some uh, wine tastings. I have a good friend there, a sommelier, that uh, taught me a few things. Uh, uh, we went with him at some uh, some wine tastings at, at, the, at the country club where I play golf, and uh, I started to kind of uh, had a glimpse of the of the wine world. Huh? So yeah, that's when I said, well, I, I want to do something related to to cooking, something related to wine. And that's uh, that was the the turning point, uh, as you were mentioning, kind of the the second chapter of my of my life. No? That's right, the second act. We get to try act. new things, <laughs> kind of like me. I, uh, I I spent the early part of my life uh, behind a microphone like this one, but uh, talking on the radio between records, and I did yeah. that for a long time. And then that that didn't it didn't really nurture me as much as I wanted it to. It's at some point, and it wasn't that I had changed; it was the, that the industry had changed. Yeah, and then I found wine, and I found restaurants, and uh, and I'm still doing that. I'm still doing wine, but now podcasting came along, and I get to hang out behind this microphone and create some cool stuff. Yeah, so, cool. yeah it's it's all about, like fun, and mm -hmm. yeah, it's all about you know the cycles and just just you know going with the rhythm of life. It sounds like you really have a a sensitive uh, a sensitive instrument where you can we can you can read what you need to be doing. Uh, and you can move from place to place and thing to thing, which is good. That's right. That's right. You know, yeah, it's uh, it's it's all about you know connecting, and uh, uh, I think that there is no no coincidence. Uh, 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 one thing that I learned is that uh, uh, all the time we are getting messages, uh, you know, from the universe or from God or whomever you want want to call it, no? 
Uh, but sometimes we don't we don't listen to the messages because we are too busy with our lives, we are too busy with our problems or what seems to be problems. But uh, mm-hmm. really, problems or troubles or difficulties are uh, situations I- situations in which there are some uh, hidden message or something to learn, and uh, that comes uh, uh, when uh, in the situations when you meet someone, or when you get a message or something. No? And, yeah, uh, yeah, it's uh, it's uh, it's an interesting uh, uh, life. is uh, is uh, is beautiful. It's interesting, even though you have different uh, difficulties or or, uh, or some situations that are not 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 fun and not comfortable. But there's yeah. always something to learn because we can we can here to grow. No? That's right. I hope so. I hope that's why we're here, or I hope that's what we're doing while we're here. Why? Why? What do you think we're here for? I think we're here to enjoy ourselves and each other. I I. I say this a lot. I say, you got to find your people. And it's not hard to find your people because there are so many people. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and they keep making more of them. You know, there's so many people <laughs> on the planet. You got to be able to find your tribe and people you can groove with and vibe with and enjoy yourself. When I found the wine people in my life, uh, and I didn't know they were waiting for me, uh, my life changed dramatically it really did mm-hmm. yeah it, it happens and um, i mean in in life we have different groups of friends and uh, it's funny because uh, i mean you can have friends that uh, can be like a friendship for life uh, we, we you keep changing from group group of friends or make new friends but the environment the people that um, that you get along with it's uh, it's kind of the energy that uh, that nurtures uh, you and you, you also nurtured your your the people that you that you met with, or mm-hmm. that you hang out with, and it's uh, it's good because uh, that's what life is. You no, know? it's uh, experiences, moments, um, situations, and uh, as you were saying, it, it's kind of uh, uh, enjoy enjoy people, but also when you have some uh, some uh, uh, difficulty or or some uh, tough moments, it's good to have people to that you can talk to your family, your friends, and uh, that's uh, that's the energy that. Uh, it gets you through the moments, no? Totally, totally. Speaking of moments, this is the moment that you've been waiting for, Javier. <laughs> this is when I reveal to you what's in my glass. Wow, I'm curious. <laughs> <laughs> I know that you are because I've been swirling it at you. <laughs> okay, I have a red wine also, as you can tell. Yeah. And uh, I'll, I'll I'll be posting pictures of my bottle and your bottle on Instagram. Uh, this is a yeah. red wine from Portugal, hmm. but it's not port. A lot of people think no. Portugal, port. That's it. Oh, you no. know, no. the fortified dessert wine that if you drink a little bit too much of it after dinner, you're going to have a headache the next day. Uh, <laughs> this is a beautiful red wine from Portugal, and it's not from the main region uh the duoro where most of the big wines come from which is kind of in the northern half of the country this is from the southern half of the country a uh, okay. an area called ala alentahano ala alentahano but a lot of times they just say uh alan i have to look at it here on my notes because there's because portuguese is complicated Oh, yeah. you know, it's, it's I'm here to spanish mm-hmm. i'm here talking to you and and if we speak spanish we 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 say we say an H sound for that J, and in Portuguese, it's more of a Z sound. Z, man. It's more of a Z sound. So this one... It's, it's Alentejo, no? Alentejo, yes. But yeah. in, in Portuguese, Alentejo. 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 Sim, sim. Mm-hmm. So this is from a producer. Uh, producer, where is his name on the bottle? It's funny how sometimes the name is not on the bottle. Uh, anyway, it's a guy named Luis, and what is his line? Uh, Luis, da, da, da. see, this is all stuff I'm going to edit out. <laughs> Good. <laughs> uh, the wine is called Rubrica. That's the name Rubrica. of the wine, Rubrica. And in mm-hmm. the Portuguese, Rubrica means signature, and but it can mean yeah. a lot of different things. Rubrica, if you look it up, if you look up the etymology of the word, uh, you know, rubric in English means uh, a lot of different things. Mm-hmm. But in the Portuguese and in the intent of the word rubrica on this wine is that it is the signature wine mm-hmm. made by this winemaker. 
And uh, the grapes come from the home property, which is eight hectares, which I believe is uh, about 12 or 13 acres. So we're talking about a small little piece of property where they grow the grapes. Uh -huh. And this wine, the thing about this wine, the main thing you need to know about this wine is that, you know, it's a blend. But not only is it a blend, it's a blend of what I would call probably most of the grapes we think of as the darkest grapes, the grapes that make the darkest wines. Um, for instance, Alicante Bouchette. That's one of those uh, Italian grapes. It's very dark skinned and actually has dark flesh, which is unique among red wine grapes. Also, Turiga Nacional, which is the big, the big dark red wine grape that they grow in Portugal. Also, another one called Aragones. Uh -huh. And then one from France, Syrah, also a very dark skinned grape that makes a very dark wine. And then, if that wasn't enough, Petit Verdot which is from a different region in France, but Petit Verdot in the Bordeaux region is used to add darker color to the blend of those Bordeaux wines. So this wine, when I saw it, I thought, oh, this is interesting because these are all very dark, dark, dark grapes. Mm -hmm. I have to have it. And when I poured it in the glass for the first time, I thought, wow, this is a very, very dark red wine. Yeah. And then when I, when I held it up to my nose for the first time, I thought, this is so dense smelling it's mm. it's almost weird and it has in the nose something that you don't get very often uh this really intense minerality that leans toward what i can only describe as iron like okay like the smell of iron ore or maybe the mm. iron you would smell at a, at a, at a smelter uh in, in a very good way but it's it's a very intense smell and then you get into all the very 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 dark fruit smells and a lot of earthy smells and and this wine i feel like this is from the 2013 vintage 2013 okay 2013 oh, that, vintage definitely that wine uh calls for a steak isn't it oh yeah for sure and here i am you know in the middle of the day just drinking this by itself <laughs> <laughs> we're recording this in the middle of the day and I'm just drinking it by itself while we're recording. I will be finishing this glass later, maybe with something a little bit meatier. That's right. That's right. Sounds like a very interesting uh, wine. I mean, it's also an interesting blend. I was I was uh, looking here at the map that's in the that's in south of Portugal. No? Yeah, that's the southern know. part of Portugal. Part. Uh -huh. And it's not you know one of the more uh, heralded regions of Portugal, but I did a little research on this region, they call it the breadbasket of Portugal. Uh, they have vast uh, countryside, undulating plains, and rich, fertile soil. Um, and it's mostly agriculture, livestock, and forestry mm -hmm. down there in the south. Uh, several types of traditional cheeses, wines, and smoked hams and sausages made in the Alentejo region. Uh, mm -hmm. They're also known for olive oil. And mining industries, uh, a lot of marble. They're mining a lot of marble down there. Wow. And uh, those are those those are some of the other important activities in the region. And then, this this really strikes close to home here. The region is home to the world's most important area for the growing of cork. The cork yeah. oak trees. Uh, they call them sobriero. Uh, grown commercially in the region for the past three hundred years. And the the bark of the cork oak is still harvested by means uh, by teams of men using locally made hand axes. No mechanical method has yet been invented that will allow the harvest to be achieved as effectively. So they're still making they're still pulling the bark off of these trees the way they've been doing it for three hundred years, which I find pretty yeah, they fascinating. Have to, they have to peel the the tree literally, you know. Yeah. yeah, they peel the tree about every seven years. To get the oak off there. And the, the cork oak tree is the only tree known that will allow this regular stripping of bark without damaging the tree. Mm -hmm. Now, here's a fun fact. The harvest of one mature tree provides bark to produce about 4,000 wine corks. Wow. So if anybody ever asks you when you're talking about cork oak trees, and I know you talk about this all the time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <and they> say, <laughs> How many corks do you get from one tree? About 4,000. 
but but only but only every seven years or so do you get to do that yeah that's a that's an interesting industry I, i'm going to teach you a, another word in spanish that you're going to like it you know what's the, the 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 spanish word for for bark for for the bark in the cork tell me it's uh, alcornoque 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 <laughs> See, I can roll yeah. my R's pretty well, can I? Yeah, you're improving your accent, Alcornoque. Alcornoque. That's <laughs> so. That's the term for the bark itself. That's right for the for the, the, the bark covering of the from the cork the tree. That's right, exactly. Mm -hmm. Alcornoque. Alcornoque. Mm -hmm. It almost sounds like okie dokie. Okie dokie, smoky. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so that's 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 the wine that's in my glass. It's a dark, dark, dark wine. Good, good. And, well, and this cheers. is, like I said, yeah, cheers to you, Javier. Now, can you tell me about wine consumers in Mexico City? Say we go out to a nice place to eat there, and I really hope to come see you one day. Uh -huh, yeah, you have what, to come. What do the wine lists look like? What's the makeup of a wine list in a nice restaurant in Mexico City? I know it's a thriving, thriving restaurant community there. Mm -hmm, yeah. Yeah, well, it, it depends on, on, uh, on the restaurant. Now, but uh, uh, what we're doing right now is uh, kind of try to uh, uh, give some support to the, to the local wineries, you know, in, in, uh, in northern Mexico, in uh, Baja California. There's uh, it's a region that is uh, it's booming in the in the last uh, in the last years. So you you find in the in the menus in the restaurants some interesting options on the on the wines of uh, of uh, Valle de Guadalupe, which is the northern part of the of the peninsula of Baja California. Yeah. But uh, yeah, but uh, but you find very interesting um, uh, wines from all, all all over the world. You know, Spain, France, uh, uh, United States, of course. Australia, so it depends on where you go. But there are there are some restaurants that they try to dedicate their the menu uh, and uh, especially the 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 food that they cook to pair with uh, wines from uh, from Baja California. The thing with the with the wines of uh, of, Me of Mexico and Baja California that uh, are a bit expensive uh, compared to the to the prices of of uh, wines that comes from Europe, which mm -hmm. doesn't make uh, a lot of sense if you will think about it. No, but uh, but there are small producers, um, and that's why. No, that's, uh, well, and it's also a younger region, which means they've just right. started buying the land and mm -hmm. buying the stuff they need to make the wine and, and creating the region from, from scratch, whereas a lot exactly. of the producers in Europe, that's that's property that was purchased hundreds and hundreds of years ago. And, and yes, right. it always used to amaze me at how some of the imports would come in when I was buying wine for restaurants and say, you know, the Italian importer would come in and I'd say, that's a really great wine. I want that. How much is it? And he would tell me if we wanted to put it on by the glass, he would sell it to me for $8 a bottle. Wow. <laughs> and I thought, <laughs> how can you do that? You know, you have to make the wine over there and bottle it and then pack it up and ship it on a ship all the way across the oceans and then all the way across the country to get it to California. And I can still buy it for $8 a bottle. How does anybody that's, make money? Yeah, that's right. It kind of doesn't add up, no? but yeah, no, it's a it's a different industry. No? It's a right. different it's, world. Yeah, it's a different world. It's well, that's really world. cool. Yeah, it's good. But but, but that uh, answers your question. Yeah, I mean, we, we you find the different kind of, of wines and uh, and uh, there's uh, interesting. Uh, I mean, we don't have the, the, like the 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 tasting rooms that you have there in California, which was a very uh, interesting. Uh, 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 business model for me, but uh, there are some uh, wine tastings in the restaurants or in different areas uh, or related to some activity with the painting or well or with uh, in, for instance like uh, I just received an invitation a, a few hours ago that uh, there's this uh, French uh, French cheeses uh, store that is offering some uh, wine tasting with uh, uh, to come to come with this uh, exotic uh, well not exotic with this special uh, French uh, cheese. So okay. that's the kind of uh, of offer that you you find. No, uh, depends on the restaurant, uh, uh, wines from over the world. Um, that's uh, that's main, mainly the, the the idea to to to, to the, the wine experience here in Mexico. Okay, that's also, good to there, know. There are some uh, there are some uh, uh, area in the. Um, it's like three hours driving from Mexico City. I'm sure you've heard about this town. It's uh, San Miguel de Allende. I don't know if you heard about it. 
I have heard of it, yes. Yeah, it's a very beautiful town. Uh, it's a, we call it here in Mexico, a magical town. Mm. Um, and uh, there are some uh, very interesting uh, wineries there, vineyards, and they're, they're producing some good wine. Uh, they have won some awards. And uh, that's that's been uh, our, uh, my wife and I uh, do these trips, wine trips, uh, like three, four times a year, go to San Miguel de Allende or go to uh, to Valle de Guadalupe to 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 know places to to find also uh, interesting uh, uh, offers of restaurants and, uh, and all kind of uh, of options. No? All right, I'm gonna start planning my trip. Yeah, you have to to know these uh, these latitudes. Yeah, for sure. Um, we talked about cooking earlier. You cook for people uh, in the woods or at the beach. When you're yeah. at home. What do you like to cook? What's something that when you're getting ready to cook it for your family, they get all excited about? What's one of your uh, specialties de la casa? <laughs> Especialidades de la casa. <laughs> yeah, well, um, I, I my favorite is when I when I uh, uh, do it on, on the grill. No? Uh, mm -hmm. We have a, a small terraza here at the apartment, and uh, I have my my grill, and. Uh, I think that to cooking with fire is a is a great experience. Actually, one of the episodes of episodes of my podcast, I I did it with a with a chef uh, on a restaurant here in in uh, in Mexico. That uh, the um, we went to the this uh, um, pairing uh, dinner, and the 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 whole menu was cooked with fire. In the in the restaurant, they have the very sophisticated grill and all the all the, the dishes were made with uh, you know with coal or, or with uh how do you call the timber the real wood? fire yeah real i mean fire, yeah. There, there are restaurants here in california they say all live fire cooking that's right that, that's what i'm talking about so anyway my, my favorite um, um option is to, to cook on the grill and i do all kinds of, of, of stuff there you know rusted vegetables um I am a, a uh, my favorite uh, food is uh, steak. Or, you know, I like to cook a, um, a ribeye. Mm. You know, I, I am, I am, a, my, my mouth is watering now. And uh, I mean, in the grill, you can do many, many things. No, And also, uh, when I cook on the stove in the kitchen, uh, I'm good at doing some pastas. You know, you know, pasta, you can improvise a lot of things. You can kind of do some different uh, combinations. Mm -hmm. uh, and I have a special recipe that I like. Uh, that's from my mom. It's uh, it's uh, uh, cut fish. It's a, it's a Spanish recipe. Uh, cut fish from the, from the Northern Sea on, on the, uh, up there in, in Europe. Uh, with, with, that comes with a lot of ingredients. And uh, that's, a, that's kind of a favorite uh, dish that kind of uh, transport. Uh, I kind of travel back to my childhood and uh, that's something that I like to cook and also cook for my for my family. So that's it's kind of a it's kind of a party uh, uh, happening when I when I do the the cup fish. I can just see it now. You and your family are there. You got some good mm -hmm. wine open. That's right. Music is playing, and you're in charge in the kitchen. That's right. And, <laughs> uh, yeah. Now you mentioned music. Yeah, music is is a very special ingredient in in, every, in any gathering. No? It's yes. A, kind of uh, evokes memories and moments, and that's a, that's a very special ingredient, which uh, I. I always uh, select the music and uh, like to uh, play it, and it also brings 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 memory to my kids. No? Yeah, yeah. Well, especially when you're cooking, it's great to have music going because it can keep oh, yeah. it can push you, it can drive you. Yeah, you definitely. Uh, Javier, obviously, you enjoy podcasting since you now have two of them. <laughs> yeah. But have you been a guest on many podcasts? No, actually, this is uh, the the first time, and uh, well, uh, the second time. Uh, um, well, the first time I was as a, as a translator, <laughs> but uh, oh, yeah, okay. first time, yeah, first time is as, as a guest, and I, I, it's been a, it's been a good experience. I, I, I appreciate very much your uh, invitation, and it's, uh, it's definitely a lot of fun. It's fun, right? You're not having to ask yeah. the questions. You're just, you're just waiting for me to ask you a question, and then you just get to talk about yourself. Which who doesn't love to talk <laughs> about themselves, right? That's right. <laughs> Do you listen to a lot of podcasts? Yeah, I um, I like to to listen to podcasts in different uh, different areas, and uh, as I told you, I I uh, I've, uh, I've been studying uh, Kabbalah for quite a while, so I I listen to some podcasts. Uh, one is uh, called Spiritually Hungry, 
which is very good. I recommend it. Okay. Also, another one that is uh, called the the weekly energy boost. Okay. It's uh, it's, all, it's also related to spirituality. It's kind of uh, it kind of gives you a, a weekly spiritual forecast, you know, to kind of know how to how to navigate in life. <laughs> So it uh, kind of gives me a note in, in every in every now and then, and uh, I'm, uh, I'm I also like to uh, I like to be up to date on what's happening on the on the in Mexico and in the in the U.S. on the related to uh, not politics but uh, what's happening in society and uh, what's going on with the with the people. So I, I like to listen to a few podcasts. Cool. Yeah, you got to know what's going on in the world. But I like the fact that you're so in touch with this spiritual side of things because I think that's important. Yeah, yeah, it's good. No, it's uh, it's kind of uh, that's that's something that uh, 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 the same way that I always wanted to find my uh, my passion or the thing that I like. Also, when I was young, uh, I was born in in a Catholic uh, family, but. since I was very, uh, so very young, a very young age, uh, there, there was some questions. I had some questions, and a lot of things didn't add up to my to my uh, to myself at a very young age. No, so yeah. I I basically uh, didn't practice religion, quit religion, but I found Kabbalah, which was really what I know that uh, my soul was looking for, and I found a lot of uh, a lot of answers and uh, helped me a lot. No, I'll say it again. I think it's because you are. You're listening. You're doing a lot of listening, and you're hearing yeah. the voices or the energies that you need to hear, and that is guiding you through life. And Definitely. I think you're doing pretty well. I think you're doing okay. Thank you, thank you. And it's uh, it's always <laughs> good to it's always good to to find people uh, around the world, like like, like the, when we met, and uh, I, I think that's that's uh, that's a good sign, and it's something that uh, you no know, brings good moments. Uh, good friendship, and uh, that makes a lot of sense. And that's uh, that's what life is all about. To, that's what life is all moment. about. Yeah. That's right. Mm-hmm. Well, thanks so and much related, for hanging and, out. And, and, and related to wine, that's that's an important thing, no? Wine it brings it all together, right? That's right. That's why we wine it all. <laughs> wine it all. Look for it wherever you find podcasts. That's right, Javier. Thanks for hanging out. Thank you, my friend. It was a it was a very good experience. Uh, I send you a big hug here from from Mexico City, and uh, make sure to plan your trip to, to Mexico. We'll have yeah. a lot of fun here. Yes, indeed. I hope so. We can do a whole other podcast episode when I'm there live. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Hang on just a sec. I'm going to read the closing uh, credits for the show, all right? Perfect. Yeah, Don't run sure. off. The Tall Mike Wine Podcast was conceived and is written, produced, edited, and maintained by yours truly. I thank you for listening, and I'll ask you again for help in growing the podcast by giving me a rating and review on your favorite podcast app, and be sure you are subscribed so you don't miss an episode. Did you know there is a whopping two and a half years of episodes available all for free? Check out the early episodes if you weren't around way back in 2021 when I started. If you want more, head over to my Instagram. Follow me at Tall Mike Wine for pictures of Javier and me from today. Also, earlier this week, I took some fun pictures of the wildlife that lives around the pond at Nicholson Ranch. Those are pretty cool. And of course, all the wines I drink at home, food I'm eating, everything is there on the Instagram. Oh, and coasters. If you'd like some or for just general feedback, send me an email to tallmikewine at gmail.com. That's episode 44. I appreciate you listening. I'll have another episode soon, but for now, from Novato, California, I'm Mike Stone. Keep swirling. Keep sniffing. Keep sipping. Cheers. And just like that. Good. I, I love your intro and your outro. That's great. <laughs> yeah. I got some good ideas. from. from oh, good. Yeah. Me. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I just really like it to be a show, you know? Yeah. And I think those elements are important to let Definitely. people know we're starting and to let people know we're done, but mm-hmm. you know, there's stuff we need to say to you. And and I try to do right. that with every episode to keep it, you know, kind of consistent. That's a good idea. Good. Congratulations. Mm-hmm. It's, a, it's a great format. I love it. Oh, thank you. I'm going to 